Today on the show, I put Brad on the hot seat. What if you had unlimited money? What about your life would actually change? Then we recap for your epic adventures in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, capping it with an interview we did with Roger Whitney, the retirement answer man, talking about five strategies for boomers. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show. This is your Friday Roundup. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. I am really excited to talk about this live case study uh, that we had this past week with Allison and Physician on Fire, and I can't wait to get your thoughts on this as well. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, I'm actually... <laughs> I'm just going to say, we can't start an episode where you don't say quite well. You have to be quite well. If there's ever a point in time where you're not doing quite well, we're going to just stop the show and mic drop it. <laughs> Yes, yeah, something catastrophic has happened if I'm not uh, quite well. No, but in all seriousness, we're actually leaving for our vacation today. So we're going to London and then a tour around Scotland for a couple of weeks. So yeah, it should be a really, really good time. Traveling with kids, man. Everything gets more complicated. You've got two kids. You're going to be gone for 21 days. You're going to multiple countries. Was the visa visa and having to lock all that down, was that pretty easy with the U.S. passport? Yeah, I don't think there's any visa requirements, or at least I hope not for the UK. You'll find out when you get there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, not too worried about that. But I got a global entry for the first time. So I'm hoping that expedites things. I Sadly, even though I'm the travel rewards guy, I have never had TSA pre-check or global entries. So we've got both now. So yeah, the whole airport process should be dramatically easier, which is nice. Well, walk me through that. So that that's not as simple as it sounds. It's not just a matter of just going online and checking a box and paying a fee and, and doing any. And, and when you're doing it with family, it's even slightly more complicated. What is the benefit for someone that hasn't, because this is kind of, this pairs very nicely with travel rewards, but obviously some people haven't even considered this. What does that look like getting this and what is the advantage of it for a family? Yeah, it was slightly more complicated than I would have imagined, but still pretty easy in the grand scheme of things. Basically, when we went to Mexico this past December, we got back into the Atlanta airport and the customs line took us. I mean, it was something crazy, like 90 90 minutes or two hours even. Like we basically said, never again. This is insane. So I looked into global entry and I realized that it's only $100 for five years of having this service. So $20 a year. It also gives you TSA pre-check. So while pre-check in and of itself is just like a couple bucks cheaper, I think it's $85 for five years. With this, you get TSA pre-check and global entry. As most people know, there are multiple lines for checking in when you get to an airport for going through security, et cetera. And TSA pre allows you to kind of bypass the normal line. You don't have to take your shoes off. You don't have to take your laptop out. So it makes that process dramatically easier and saves a lot of time. And then as I understand it, when you are coming back into the U.S., the customs lines are a hundredth as long, essentially. You basically, I think you scan your fingerprint and your global entry card or some such. And yeah, I mean, that basically kind of expedites you through customs, which can be a real time saver. And with my family, we're anticipating traveling dramatically more basically from here on out. So this seemed like a no brainer for us. But to your question, you do have to get global entry for every member of your family. So my wife and daughters each needed to get it. So this did cost us $400, but luckily I I did have some cards that had global entry as a statement credit. So some of the real premium travel cards offer that as an option, but really we applied online and I don't know what type of background checks they do then, but once you are conditionally approved, you actually have to go in for an interview. And now luckily there is a Richmond office. There did not used to be, it opened fairly recently. So before that people had to drive to DC basically. 
which is obviously a big pain. But for you and I, Jonathan, it's you know just a 20 minute drive to the airport. And I guess the Customs and Border Control, I think, is who who operates it. They just had an interview and it was really like five to 10 minutes. It was just answering a couple of questions, taking your fingerprints so that you could, again, expedite that when you actually enter the country. And that was about it. But yeah, all four of us did have to technically go in there and go through that interview process. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks for breaking that down. It's certainly something that I'm looking into as well. We do have a couple of family trips coming up and anything that you can do to speed up customs would be would be awesome. So I uh, appreciate your input there. Hey, let's go ahead and talk about this past week's episode. And actually, let me lead off just because I have an anecdote that I've been sitting on for like several weeks. We recorded this, I think, what, almost like a month ago now. And I've been like, ah, great story, great story. Can't wait to tell it. But it wouldn't have meant anything until today. After we recorded with Allison, basically the next week I was going to Chattanooga. My family, a lot of them actually live in St. Elmo, a small historic neighborhood right at the end of the tail end of Chattanooga near the border of Tennessee and Georgia. And I knew I was going there and I said, we got to, you know, let's, let's meet up and get some breakfast, something along those lines. And so I got a chance to come, you know, meet her in person. And I know we talked about her home. She actually does have a beautiful home with a nice back porch overlooking the look. I don't know if it's Lookout Mountain or one of the mountains that surround Chattanooga. Apparently Chattanooga has, it's almost like stealthy active in that it probably has more bike trails, walking trails, climbing paths, you know, nature paths. It's comparable to like a Denver, Colorado. That's the sort of active lifestyle that it is. But her back porch had the most incredible view you've ever seen. Honestly, when I saw it, I thought to myself, Fritz from the Retirement Manifesto would cut off his left arm to be here just because he would want to let his drone take off the back porch and fly all over this place. It was it was absolutely beautiful. But that is only the hook to allow me to tell you my real story which is I found a castle. I kid you not, I found a medieval castle in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that, but I wanted to set this up by saying that sometimes we throw this question out there. If you had unlimited money and unlimited time, so you're at financial independence and you've kind of beaten the equation so thoroughly that money is no longer really a factor in what you do and how much you spend, what would actually change about your life? And and I'm curious, before we come back to this and I tell you a little bit more about this, what would that actually look like for you, Brad? Yeah, you know, Jonathan, this is a, a really timely question because Laura and I quite literally had this conversation this week, which is really funny and serendipitous here. We kind of hit on that really not all that much would change. I mean, we are thrilled with our new house, our neighborhood, our cars are fine. We would never buy new cars, of course, other than in a scenario where one breaks down, as I discussed at length in a a prior roundup. But so I don't think any of that would change. I mean, we are limited, obviously, with our kids' schedule. So they go to school in a regular calendar. Then they have the swim team, which is two months of the summer. And then basically August is our travel time. So I think what Laura and I hit on is that, I mean, if we had 15, $20 million and and money was just irrelevant. We probably would never fly economy again. So we probably would fly business class or first class from here on out. But in the grand scheme of things, that's a couple thousand dollars a year, right? So it's, it's not that big of a deal, but just arriving somewhere rested makes a big difference for a vacation. So I think a lot of it would come down to really a little bit extra money on vacations. And I'm talking, if we're getting an Airbnb, we naturally would say, oh, we can't spend more than X. And who knows what that X would be? $200 a night, $250. But maybe we'd splurge and go up to $400 a night or something like that. I I think we'd loosen the purse strings a little bit there. So I think on both flight and accommodations, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm never going to stay at the, the Ritz and get room service every meal and caviar and champagne, but just arriving somewhere rested and being a little more comfortable where we are instead of always kind of trying to save that extra little dollar. So yeah, I mean, I think that is what we've hit on, but honestly, I don't know that anything else would really change in our lives. I mean, we are really quite, quite happy. So yeah, Jonathan, have you ever put any thought into that? Uh, Yeah, it's, that's tough, man. That's interesting. You know, I actually, I've, I've always taken the mantle of the reluctant frugalist and that for me, frugality is a, as a tool. And I've stated, I think this was episode 29 where we go into this with a lot more depth. And it really is true that over time, my anchor has shifted 
from being a reluctant frugalist to a little bit more of a natural frugalist. But I would say that me and you are still on the opposite end of the spectrum. But I, it's, it would be so small in scale. I just don't aspire to any sort of lifestyle of the rich and famous. It's very much, I would say it's probably hobby based. So I would probably, I don't know, really dive into doing more with woodworking, exploring a new hobby, construction. So I, I, I think I have a little bit of mustachianism in me in that I like the idea of being able to do massive projects on my own myself. And I think I've told you about this a little bit, but I suspect that if money were no object, I would probably go, I would have an absurdly ridiculous uh, woodworking collection or set, but I, I don't think I'm dreaming big enough. I want to come back to the castle. We need to talk about the castle here. If you had unlimited money, what if, you, and you had unlimited time and you could do anything you wanted, at least one individual in Chattanooga, Tennessee decided that he wanted to build not just a castle, but a medieval castle and just bury it right on the top of Lookout Mountain. And Brad, I got a, I found it. I tracked it down in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I took a picture in front of it. And I'm going to put it in the show notes, but I'm also going to share it with you right now. If you check your messenger bot, this is the castle that I found. Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> that's like a legit castle. It is a legit <laughs> castle. It has like portercullises. It should have a moat with crocodiles in front of it. I mean, it's intense. Uh, so I talked to my uncle, who is the resident know-it-all in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I mean, he literally knows everybody and everything. He knows the history. He knows the genealogy of every person in the zip code. It's just incredible. I asked him what's going on with this. And he said that basically this individual, I believe, got all the marketing and licensing rights to all Game of Thrones gear. So like the weaponry, the armaments, the merchandise, everything Game of Thrones he has the marketing and licensing rights to it. And I could be off on this. This is like my interpretation of what my uncle told me. So I could, I could be vastly wrong, but I know it's tied to game of Thrones and Robert R. Jordan. And so basically he has a printing money machine for the next 10 years. And he said, you know what I want to do? I want to from scratch build a castle. And he has a website where he documents all the song, which I'll link to in the show notes. I believe it's building my because of course, if you're going to take all the time to do this, you want to talk about the process that, that actually went into it. But at the end of the day, the dude has a massive, massive full-scale castle all surrounded in the stonework that you would imagine. And the only thing he has left to do is actually install the moat with the crocodiles. It's insane. <laughs> that is very cool. Yeah, I'm not sure that I would build a castle with unlimited money, but whatever your passion is. <laughs> I don't right? think we're dreaming big enough. <laughs> <laughs> My first class flight doesn't seem too extravagant anymore. It's all about anchoring. All right. Hey, I'm going to put a picture to this in the show notes for today's episode just because I wanted to share this. But yeah, it is. Uh, it's just it's awesome. <laughs> it's really awesome. But it was almost as cool to find this as it was to get a chance to talk to Allison. And I think now we should take just a few minutes and go back and talk about this amazing episode on Monday. One of the things that resonated so much with me was the fact that she she took agency and she took action to put herself in a better financial situation. When we look at her path to financial independence, it's clear that she is going to be in a remarkably strong financial position in as little as one, two, or three years. But that one, two, or three years was 11 years in the making. And the dedication and the grit that it took to leave kind of her set path and go and do all the work to get where she is now is, I think, where we should spend some time talking about. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And there were a lot of themes that jumped out to me. First, it was overcoming limiting beliefs. I think that was a big one, right? She said, I just didn't see myself as a doctor because doctors seemed on a whole different tier than me when she was a surgical assistant. She had to overcome that, right? She overcame that with hard work and effort. And I think that is a huge theme throughout Allison's entire life here. And there were many limiting beliefs, even down to the dean of her medical school who told her she was an idiot, quote, an idiot, for going for dermatology. Basically this Dean, because he had this limiting belief of, oh, this is a medical school in the Caribbean. There's no chance, right? For anybody to get a top tier placement or residency or whatever it may be. That in and of itself was a stunning. I mean, that's the Dean of the medical school. But then you talk about positive mentors. Allison had amazing mentors that pushed her and believed in her. One of them said he'd pay for her first year of college if she just took the chance. She worked and worked and took classes at night and finished undergrad in three years. And then she had these mentors that stuck with her this entire way. They got her her position at Northwestern and then that doctor helped her get her next position. It was just this 
amazing string of connections, right? That's what we talk about here. It's connections and it's building that community. And she had it in spades. And one of the things that really stood out to me, Brad, was this idea of your life at any particular point in time is a snapshot. It is not a predictor of where you're going to be five years from now or even a week from now. You can make a choice on any given day to change direction, to change course and set a new trajectory for your life. And that is incredibly powerful. It's something that I am shocked to say I've actually seen it. It sounds it sounds good when it's written down on paper or it's on some sort of motivational poster, but it's true. It's actually reality. Five years ago, I was in pharmacy school. I had a very, very, I had an extremely set path. And today my life looks hundred percent different. It is a totally new trajectory that can be implemented in any person's life. And all you need to say is where would I like to be? What would I like to try? What would I like to position for myself to slowly start to change into this new direction or this new course? And if you believe that you can do it, you're already halfway there. Sometimes that belief doesn't come from yourself. I wish it did. I wish all of us were able to muster that belief. Sometimes it's an external force, another individual saying, you know what? I see something in you that you don't see in yourself. And I think you should try this. And sometimes it's literally just saying that out loud. So that just speaks to the power of an encouraging word. And sometimes it's just putting an ounce of money behind it. Hey, I want to pay for a single course or a one semester just to give you the chance to try this. And you saw Allison just shine. As soon as she was given the opportunity, she just took it and ran with it and said, now nothing can hold me back. What do I want to do? Yeah. And to your point about not knowing where you're going to be five years from now, I find that so empowering. You and I could not have envisioned five years prior to this that we would be talking to tens upon tens of thousands of people twice a week and making a real difference in the world. If this were five years ago today, I would be getting ready for income tax filing season for corporate state tax returns. Imagine how horrible that is. And, you know, and that was my life. And, and I'm kind of joking there. Obviously, I had a very nice job. It was it paid the bills, et cetera, et cetera. But this was tax filing season. There's no way that I'd be going on a 24 night trip to Europe right now. I would be working every second of the day to file 200 state tax returns for my corporation. You just never know. And I think the biggest takeaway for the audience is just get started. You don't have to know where your life is going to go. You just have to make positive changes. And we talk about that all the time here with the aggregation of marginal gains. Just do something today that will make your life better. And that could be just listening to this podcast and saying, hey, I don't even know where my money's going. I need to just jot everything down on a piece of paper or on a spreadsheet. And can I cut any expenses? And you just never know where we have plenty of examples, hundreds of examples, thousands probably, of people who have listened to this podcast and now they're saving tens of thousands of dollars a year. And previously they were living paycheck to paycheck. And that's just by making these small changes, but looking for them in their lives. Those things, they really do compound. They absolutely do. Just one thing, Jonathan, real quick was about having those mentors. I think one interesting thing that jumped out to me was where Allison kind of described this, this imposter syndrome that they were going to quote, figure her out. And she just didn't believe at first that she deserved to be there. But you know what she did? She outworked them. That was her quote. I just outworked them. Right. And that's a lesson for all of us that there's nobody to be worried about out there. Everyone has imposter syndrome. I mean, I've talked to people whose names are household names in our five community. And they have imposter syndrome. And it, it's crazy. Like, there's just no they. Each and every one of us can make an impact on the world if you just believe in yourself and you just start taking action. It's so easy to learn things now. I mean, you could learn how to build a house by watching YouTube videos. Or right? a castle. Right, but or a castle, as it may be. <laughs> it's, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's, you're so right. Like, you legitimately could. I have no doubt that you could watch YouTube and learn how to build a castle. That's insane. And this wasn't possible 10 or 20 years ago. So there's nobody to be worried about. I think that's the biggest thing. So many people get caught up. Oh, they went to an Ivy League school or, oh, they have those letters behind their name. Everybody has the same feelings. We all have the same concerns and mental weaknesses. And we just have to just try to live a happier and better life and just try to learn new things. I think that's my big takeaway just for life. 
And I want to come back to this aggregation of marginal gains. And, and I know we always use that phrase, but it's, it's important to tie that to actually what it looks like when someone takes action on that thought, that idea. There's a large percentage of our, of our community that makes above the median income. But there's an equally large percentage of our community that is below the median income. Therefore, that's why you have the median, right? But the point being, the strategies are different for different people. You know, with people that are making above median income, it just looks like being intentional. Being intentional helps when you're making a, a smaller salary, when you're making $30,000, $20,000 a year. But another piece of that isn't to look at your income as a fixed thing, but to say, how can I grow this? How can I focus on the strategy and actually increase that? If you go from $30,000 a year to $40,000 a year, if you are saving the difference in a pre-tax account, you overnight increase your savings rate by 25%. That's the power of living on a smaller income and then increasing that income. And then it's just looking at adding on these small little things that you can do. I want to come back to that and I want to highlight it and focus on it because I realized that there are people that heard this episode that said she made 540 K. I, I can't relate to that. Right. What I loved about her story is that isn't where she started. She, she started 28 years old with a set path, working as a surgical assistant and then being willing to do this jungle gym, almost approach and go on a eight year path. And then now she's at 42 and she just made more than physician on fire has ever made in his entire career, obviously in a single year. That is remarkable. It highlights the point that nothing is fixed. And you know, we don't need to figure out how to get every single person listening to the show to make 540 K a year. I'm I, Hey, I'd, I'd like to pull those levers if they seem reasonable for me. But the fact is you can scale that and you can focus on what would it look like to make 10 grand extra a year and save all of that towards building my perpetual money-making machine. And the great thing is you don't need to just come up with these ideas for scratch. We are going out and finding them and documenting them. People in the community are crowdsourcing them and they're saying, hey, by the way, just do this. Just try this. Every single week, we're focusing on the simple equation, how to earn more, spend less, optimize the difference. And there are an infinite number of ways to tackle this challenge. We're getting better at this together. If we can do a great job of aggregating these, right? Aggregation of marginal gains. If we can aggregate these ideas, you get to pick a la carte. What does it look to optimize my life 1% at a time and embrace this superpower, which is agency, right? It's realizing that you have control over your destiny and you can direct your life anywhere you want to go. And frankly, with Allison's situation, she has nothing but options. She's going to have to make a choice based on value. She has incredible earning potential. She could easily make half of what she's making now and still be on an incredibly fast path to financial independence. She has flexibility. But what I think she has increasingly is a plan, and she's picking something that works for her. We spent a little bit of time talking about the properties just because she had kind of accumulated these in a very unintentional manner, right? We always talk about intentional living and she had kind of stumbled into these various properties. And over the course of the episode, she was trying to figure out whether or not she should unwind from some of that. And Angela from Tread Lightly Retire Early called in a voicemail to give us some feedback. Hey guys, this is Angela over at Tread Lightly Retire Early. And I just want to call and comment on your case study episode with Allison on Monday. I thought what she's doing is absolutely fabulous and inspiring and she's incredible. But the one thing that really stuck out to me was this home that she's living in currently. The new jerk reaction was to get rid of it. Absolutely, I didn't hear anything that made me think that that was something that needed to go. All I heard was how much she loves the place and how wonderful it is for her and how much it brings joy to her life. And honestly, I would think about maybe keeping it. And maybe instead of doing the head down hustle, uh, adjust her life now to make something fabulous that, you know, even if she's making $300,000 a year and it takes a little bit longer, kind of more of a fully funded lifestyle change or a, you know, partially funded lifestyle change to uh, get her to really be able to stay in her house and really be happy with uh, what matters to her, which to me, that sounded like the house. And just because it is more expensive than somebody else might want to spend doesn't mean that it's the wrong choice for her. Thanks. And I uh, look forward to hearing more in the future. Yeah, Angela, thank you for the voicemail. Certainly. I agree with you that FI is not about deprivation. It's about figuring out what you value in life and going for it. And I think clearly 
Allison described this home that was wonderful for her. And I know what, I don't think we gave the advice to sell it. I, I really have no recollection of that. I think my question was, are there other areas in Chattanooga that you can get the same items that make you happy about your house in a different area where it's significantly cheaper? And she said that she hadn't found that yet. So to me, there's no pressing urgency really to sell the house. I mean, clearly if there were specific items that were only, only about that particular house, like let's say a school district or something. Okay. Then I get not being able to move. But if she can replicate what she does love about the house in a lower cost of living area, then maybe she should continue looking into it. I mean, obviously if this is a fool's errand spending hundreds of hours looking, that's not a good use of her time, but she should probably be loosely aware of what she values out of the house and see if she can find it somewhere else. But yeah, clearly it was not my impression at all that that we said sell the house and and move. I think Allison's really done a good job, even with the rental house. I think she said this year she expects to cover the full amount of her expenses with the rental, and they still get to use it and enjoy it. So to me, it sounds like she's in a pretty enviable position, even though she quote unquote has multiple mortgages. And from the face of it, it sounds like an unenviable position, but, but it really isn't when we dove into it and not for nothing, but Allison obviously makes a significant amount of money and she can afford these mortgages if they add value to her life. So yeah, that's where I come down on it for sure. So Brad, I thought the next thing we could take just a second and talk about is the journal of accountancy, which is the premier journal. If you happen to be in the profession that you chose for the duration of your career, featured an article talking about how accountants can serve the I kid you not fire community. We are on the map. Accountants are now thinking about what it would look like. What's what benefits they can add to this very specific and what you would think of as niche community. And it's not really a surprise to me because when we think of the people that we lean on very quickly, as your finances become slightly more complicated, because maybe you've added in a side hustle that became a business. Maybe you're planning some sort of advanced tax withdrawal strategy you start quickly wondering, is there someone that I could go to with these questions? Is there someone that can help me with this? Is there someone that, that I could add to the team? And uh, this article was pretty cool, man. Yeah, it certainly was. And I, I love in the table of contents here, it's the August 2018 issue of the Journal of Accountancy, which, as you said, is a very prestigious journal in the accounting world. It's fired up for early retirement. Learn how CPAs can help members of the FIRE movement, a group of financially savvy consumers whose goal it is to retire in their 40s, 50s, or even younger. And I thought, what a great lead-in. I mean, that's brilliant in and of itself. And this was neat to see. I think it's just showing that the FIRE movement is gaining more respectability, and it's also, it's just growing significantly. So certainly to be continued, and I'm sure we'll, we'll see many more of these pop up. But yeah, this was a neat one for me, especially. And Brad, this is actually a question that I have for you, and you're like probably actually the worst person to answer this with your background in accounting because you're kind of, you're like the ultimate DIY and you're like, Oh, I can do this. Anybody can do this. But I think that a large percentage of our audience is wondering at what point is TurboTax not cutting it anymore. And, you know, with your background, is there anything that really stands out to you in terms of at what point it's time to maybe put aside the DIY mentality and go find a team member? Yeah, that's a very good question, Jonathan. And and in fairness, I think TurboTax and other software items like that do a really wonderful job for the vast majority of people who have returns that are not very complex at all. Maybe they have some 1099s, a W-2, some other just assorted little things, some donations. You can do your return yourself. There's no need to pay a professional $300 for your return or more even. For me, I think the vast majority of people really can do it as long as you're just taking a catalog of, of where your money is, making sure you get all your 1099s and just keeping track, right? I think anybody in the FI community can do that. But once you get into more complex scenarios where maybe you have some partnerships and you're getting K1s and there are multiple items on there, if it's just income in box one, well, TurboTax can do that. But if there's some other nonsense on the K1, that might be a little too much. You might want to hire an accountant. If you have rental real estate and you have to do some type of depreciation and you think that's beyond your capabilities and you don't want to screw it up, well, there would be a reason to hire an accountant. I mean, myself, even though I am a CPA, 
I only have a tiny little base of knowledge of the entire world of accounting. So there are issues that I run into that I clearly need someone. I have no idea how to pay payroll tax. That's something that's never crossed my plate. I've never had an S corp. And I think that's something that you and I are contemplating also. And we've actually gotten in touch with Shane Mason, who we had on a prior episode talking about the QBI deduction. And it really intrigued me and it kind of started a conversation. And I think, yeah, we are going to move towards that in the future potentially. So you just have to know your limitations. You have to know where you can rely on someone who's really, really knowledgeable. So I think you can't be too proud, just like anything in life. Like I could say, oh, I'm a CPA and my wife, Laura, is a CPA. There's no way we're hiring someone. That's what someone who has a big ego and and is too proud would do. But for me, this is a no brainer. If I can outsource this to someone who is really knowledgeable and can do it just in a matter of hours, whereas it would take me dozens of hours to research and I'd still feel uncertain, then that's the slam dunk for me. But I think for most people out there, it's just try to get a sense of the complexity of your return and see, is TurboTax really cutting it? And for most people, the answer is going to be, yes, it's absolutely fine. And if you get to that point, then it might be time to start looking for an accountant. Here's a thought for you. So finding an accountant, interviewing an accountant and deciding to trust this accountant with said return. Any thoughts on what questions like you would ask for them? I mean, I think in our case, we've kind of found accountants based on just networking. And maybe that is a really, really good strategy. Like for instance, you're in a local group, you're having an accountant that's in all sorts of the conversations and you just start a conversation and then you see where it leads from there. But for that individual that is literally going to Google and says, Hey, accountant in Henrico, Virginia, and you get all of them pop up. Like, are there any questions that you would ask of that accountant before really continuing the conversation? That is yet another good question, Jonathan. I, I don't have- Professional set. question asker. That's what yeah, I do, Mondays yeah. and Fridays. <laughs> you are quite good. You are quite good. No, I don't have a set list of questions that I would ask, but just off the top of my head, I know right now, at least, I would be asking about the new tax law and what would be the implications for me or for taxpayers like me. So I think I'd, I'd want to get a sense of, are they up on the, the recent- changes in tax law, right? Because this is significant. And if you're getting somebody who's just not inquisitive and has no even knowledge that something's going on, well, that's going to raise alarm bells, clearly. I think I would ask them to review my prior year return and see if there's anything that jumps out to them. I'd be curious about their thoughts. So I think that's generally what I would do. You know, I could ask some inside baseball stuff that's not going to be applicable to the audience, but I, I think that's generally where I'd start. I'd ask them, what am I potentially missing based on my scenario that I don't have on my return? You know, I, if, if I was a DIYer, what, what could I be missing? So if, again, for most people, their returns just aren't that complex, but there just may be things that are outside of the scope of what they know or what TurboTax asked them to enter, right? So I think I would just try to get that background and see basically where they fell on, on the knowledge scale. Yeah, that's very interesting because the what I wouldn't want is basically to go hire someone and basically what they're doing is just data entry into TurboTax for me. I mean, I don't mind if you use an automated software, that's no big deal. But uh, in my mind, an accountant is a value add. They're not just an expense. They're actually saving you additional money that you would not have recognized on your own. Certainly, I love your idea about having them take a look at the past year's returns. And if they just basically say, wow, you just totally crushed it. I don't see anything here to improve on. And you're thinking to yourself, well, this didn't take me very long. I'm probably just going to keep doing it myself, right? But if they say, yeah, I think there are a lot of opportunities here for you to improve and then have them present those ideas to you. Now you're moving forward. And I don't think that where you start is always where you finish. You know, I think there is kind of a level of intimacy when you're adding someone onto the team that as they understand better your financial situation and some of the, the, you know, maybe the things that you're dealing with, they can continue to add value to it. But I also like the idea of growing together. So it's not someone, it's not just a set and forget. It's kind of once you find that team member, they are a valuable member of that team going forward. So finding someone that has that inquisitive mind, that's always looking to improve and help you get closer to your goals, I would think would be really, really key as you look for someone to add to your team for that next maybe decade or so. So 
Awesome. Well, hey, let's go ahead and pivot just a little bit here. This past week, we were in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We went for a conference, Podcast Movement. It is where podcasters from all over the country, 2,000 podcasters, converged on Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for a four or five day kind of learning session, networking session, presentation, keynotes. It was just a support group for podcasters. And it was really cool to kind of break outside of our little tiny niche over here in the financial independence, personal finance community and meet people that were podcasting about every topic under the sun. But aside from that, one added benefit for us is we actually got a chance to do a Philly meetup. This was our first combined road trip where we actually got to hook up with a local community. And I think we had somewhere in between 130 and 150 people show up. It was just mind-blowingly awesome. We had a fabulous time and it was amazing just to get to meet so many of you in person. Yeah, that was the first night we got there and and clearly was the highlight for me. I mean, I basically could have could have went home after that and it would have been a very successful trip. It was it was remarkable to see how many people showed up and the distances that they traveled. We had one person travel from Rochester, New York. He drove six hours. Somebody else from Pittsburgh. I know our friends Rich and Jill came from Long Island. They celebrated was, their anniversary yeah. at the meetup. It was amazing. How cool was that? <laughs> so cool. <laughs> <laughs> a nice Phi anniversary weekend. That was that was awesome. And yeah, we just had an absolute blast and just spent, it was what, four hours basically at this meetup, just chatting and talking Phi and, and just finding out things about people's lives. So yeah, that was really, really, truly amazing. So a huge thanks to everybody who showed up. And yeah, actually, Jonathan, I didn't didn't mention this to you, but we're having a meetup in London this week, which is really cool. So obviously this uh, podcast is going out on the 3rd of August and it's actually a little uh, time shifting here. It was it was the day before. So it's it's upcoming for me when I'm recording this, but it's uh, Thursday, August 2nd. And yeah, I know Barney, the escape artist, is is expecting somewhere in the vicinity of 50 to 60 people. So it should be really, really cool. That is so awesome. So incredibly cool. 50 to 60 people. People in London. That's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, the fire is truly spreading. And I mean, that is just a testament to it. These meetups are happening all across the world. And yeah, to get that many people show up in London is is really awesome. I just can't wait. With podcast movement, I actually recorded a segment, which we're going to we're going to play in just a second here for you. But there's two extra things that I wanted to mention. One is that FinCon is coming up in September. That is kind of the finance community. It's a conference that's very similar for personal finance bloggers and and people that are in that space. But we're going to be giving a talk on kind of behind the scenes what we have done over the last two years to create a, you know, at least in our minds, high quality podcast, something that really resonates and seems to have garnered a fair amount of traction over the last year. I think we are about to hit five million downloads within the next month or two. But And that's really cool and it's awesome for FinCon, but you're our community and many of you are actually interested in this. This is not a show about how to podcast. There certainly are uh, shows dedicated just to that topic that you could find and explore if that's something that you're really interested in. But just like we dedicated a Friday roundup to how to start a blog, if that's something you're interested in, I feel like we can talk about this topic with a little bit of authority. And I think it'll be a value add for some of you. And so I've talked to Brad about this offline, but in an upcoming episode, we are going to dedicate a Friday roundup to just some of the things that we're going to be talking about in FinCon, but just in our own way, kind of walking you through what we did well at the beginning, what we did horrible at the beginning, things that we kind of stumbled on along the way, and just kind of what has built this show in the background, maybe behind the scenes. I think you'll benefit from it and be interested in it. I hope that it resonates with you, but I've, we've kind of got that in the works. We're going to probably do that episode sometime in September or October. The second thing is the segment that I wanted to play for you. I, let me go ahead and set this up in that when we were at Podcast Movement, we had access to thousands of podcasters and we thought to ourselves, what would make for kind of a, a mini episode that we could play on a Friday? And we bumped into Roger, the retirement answer man, who has an incredible podcast focusing on helping people achieve an awesome traditional retirement. Brad and I have realized for a long time now that there's plenty of overlap. If you're interested in early retirement, by definition, those same tools will be useful to you for traditional retirement. But we don't spend a ton of time focusing and targeting on boomers about to focus on pulling the lever for their traditional retirement. And we thought that Roger would be able to come in and give us some of his insights and speak to both of our communities. And so we asked him to join us. What we're going to play next is that recording recorded live 
at Podcast Movement 2018. So Brad, there is a large percentage of our audience that is just pursuing a great traditional retirement. While our message still, there's plenty of overlap there. I thought it would be cool to get Roger on the show and just kind of get his take on this as well. Yeah, I'm excited. And I think one of the biggest areas of overlap is something we say all the time here with the FI community is, what are you running towards? Not what are you running away from? So I think that's something Roger is definitely going to explore. And I'm really excited to chat about it. So Roger, with that, welcome to the show. It's awesome to be here at Podcast Movement with you guys. One of the reasons I'm excited to have you on the show is I feel like we could be guilty of sometimes focusing too much on this 25 to maybe even 45, 50 year old age bracket and not acknowledging that there are a lot of boomers in our audience. And I know that, you know, this represents your community, right? Yeah, I I speak specifically on my show to people over 50, baby boomers. And it's nice to let an old guy on the show, by the way. I appreciate that. Who are thinking in terms of traditional retirement, because when we grew up, that was the model, right? You save and invest, save and invest, and then you can have those brochure type of life moments later on in life. Brochure type <laughs> life moments. What can you put on a trifold? Exactly, right? That's, my, that's what my life is supposed to be. And they're struggling with wanting to get out of the rat race because of corporate America, whether it's travel or you know all the changing goals or layoffs. And they're ready for some life freedom, which is much healthier in your generation and and your audience of having some life balance, but they're, they're struggling with how to do that. That's very interesting. And I'm curious, what are some like actionable tips? Where do you start with this individual? This individual that's kind of has bought into the, I'm going to delay everything until 65. And that's when I have, you know, now, now I'm able to enjoy my golden years. That's the theme that I see. And a lot of people I think tend to like I don't know, maybe you kind of miss the window up till then. Everything is just, oh, well, that's going to be fine. What is your perspective on that? Well, and there is this natural tension in everyone's life of they want to have as good of life as they can today, right? Because this is the only day you have, and your life is today. The only the once? Right, yeah, that YOLO thing, right? <laughs> but then they're, You're too old to know that. <laughs> <laughs> my, my son calls me a hipster that's a dad, so I'm a dipster. <laughs> that's what he says. But there's this natural tension to wanting to have a great life today and wanting to be a good steward and be okay tomorrow. And that tension never goes away, right? And for baby boomers, they've been sold from a traditional financial advice perspective to sacrifice, 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 and you can live later on. Well, the retirement numbers for most people just don't work. The math does not work anymore. And that's why we have so many people freaked out because they don't know how to bridge that gap. So when I survey my audience, who are baby boomers, when I ask them what do they really want in retirement, it's not the absence of work. They just want time freedom to pursue things that they actually enjoy. And so the two main things that I've seen is one is most people approach retirement as a baby boomer running away from the pain of whatever their career is, you know, whether it's the travel or the corporate meetings. And so they focus on getting to retirement from a take away the pain aspect, right? Which is a good motivator. Pain is a good motivator. Very effective. (laughs) Very effective. But they don't think too much about what they're running to, right? So if you think, you know, you can imagine someone running away from something, you just want to get away to something that takes away the pain, but you have no clue where you're going to end up. So yeah, I mean, I think it's easy to talk about the money, but so much of this is mental and actually coming up with that frame of what you want your life to look like. How do you talk to your audience about that. Well, that's a great point because what I try to do is reverse their their view of, okay, yeah, the pain is the motivator, but you better have a a compelling vision that's pulling you somewhere. And that's much more empowering, much more actionable than just take the pain away. And that's the one thing I love about the FI community is that it is about a more balanced approach to those two pieces of tension. Because if you think about your life, it's like a teeter-totter. You know, seesaw. Now, you guys, those things are probably outlawed now, but, you know, Baby Boomer knows what they are. (laughs) I grew up with them, too. Trampolines, diving boards, seesaws. All gone. All All the fun. But anyway, we're, you know, we're like straddling a teeter-totter, trying to balance the thing in between the two, between having a good today and a, a good tomorrow. So with Baby Boomers, what I try to help them do is I pull some of the things you guys talk about all the time of retirement is not binary. It's not working and not working. Most people find a lot of value in work. They just want to do something they love more that gives them time freedom. And I call it pre-tirement, which is sort of 
you think about your life as a baby boomer, it's not a light switch. I work and then I don't work. It's more like a dimmer switch. How do you start to intentionally take action to find something where maybe you like make a lot less money, but you're doing something you love that helps bridge the gap financially? Because that's usually the big pressure, right? Yeah. So I guess we focus on actionable takeaways. So let's say there's someone in our audience who's listening to this. They're maybe five to seven years away from a traditional retirement. What do you tell that person as far as real action to start taking now, both mentally and with their money? So mentally, the first place is envisioning what that future is going to be. So if you're in your 50s, you're likely an empty nester or about becoming an empty nester. Like my wife and I, we're, we're new empty nesters. And that's a, a good period of time when you're reevaluating what the rest of your life is because your roles are changing, right? And so the first step is having little conversations, whether it's with yourself if you're single or with your spouse of, what do we want to happen in, in the next four to five years? Where do we want to try to get to? And where I think a lot of planning goes wrong is people think too far into the future and they think they have to figure it all out. I would much rather have someone think about how they want to position their life. Like my wife and I, our vision is to downsize our home, keep our home base because we're going to end up having grandkids and things like that, but then go live different places for a month or two at a time. So four years ago, for us to start working towards that vision, I pivoted how my business is. So I'm much more location independent as an advisor. So I don't have to be tied to an office. I can literally work from anywhere now, whereas before I couldn't. So the first is painting that vision of not from a money perspective, but what is it, if we could have everything, what would that look like? Do you have a template of what a conversation like that I guess, between you and your wife looks like. So many people, it is that delayed gratification, right? They've been living this life, maybe 18 years, 20 years of having kids. And it's hard to flip that switch of, okay, what does life look like for us? So to have that conversation is not something that they're going to sit down and say, okay, and go. How do you talk them through that? Well, I think being married is sort of a, a barrier to having those kind of conversations, right? Because, you know, I've been married 28 years and you just get into your routines. And that's where an advisor or even a, like a, a coach of some sort, usually it, it's more productive if it's facilitated or even done in a group setting because, and I've seen this time and time again, working with a husband and wife say, they're sitting there, the husband or the wife can say something and they could have been saying it for years, but the other one never hears it. And then when I'm in a meeting and I hear it and I say it, all of a sudden, it's heard. <laughs> it's right? so unfair, but so true. <laughs> it is just human nature. So it is difficult one-on-one -on -one to be able to do that. And I think that's where you have to find some way to extract yourself. I've, I've known couples that have taken retreats, even without being facilitated, where they get out of their environment. They go hiking or they go on long road. Here's one, one good practical tip. If you want to have a, a more impactful conversation with your spouse or your kids, go for a long walk go on a road trip, do something where you're not facing each other because it creates space, especially if it can be physical because it creates space and it's less intimidating and things come out much easier when you're not facing someone and you're putting an activity with it. I love the idea of these conversations. It's actually been a theme that we have seen from other sets, like a mindset perspective, not even in the context of figuring out what your retirement is going to look like, but what your ideal life looks like, right? I mean, that is a perennial conversation that needs to be perpetually had. See, perennial, perpetual, see what I did there. I could come up with another one. You're so fancy with these <laughs> good words. With these word things, you're so fancy. <laughs> but like the slight pivot on this would be there are mindset conversations and then there are money conversations. They're not substantially different, but there is a small pivot there. What does the money half of this look like? What I believe in is something called agile retirement management, which comes from agile project management. So you think of your phone, you always have apps that are updating, right? And that's because they're developed to focus on the most important things and they do it in an iterative way. So I've been married 28 years. My secret to a good marriage is I never want to have a big conversation with my wife. If I can avoid big conversations, that means we're walking hand in hand and I'm having little conversations that sometimes can be a little uncomfortable, but we're having them. So they don't build to something bigger. So when you're dealing with money, I think it's about little things that you can take action on today in an intentional way. So for around the money aspect, if we think about money, it's like running a business. You have cash flow and you have spending 
and you have income. Most people, when they think about their cash flow, they focus on the spending and budgeting with the B word. Oh, uh, oh. Uh, hate the, yeah, I, and I hate the B word. I do not want to be a bookkeeper <laughs> of my life. But it's an important part. And a friend of mine, you probably know, Paula Pant, she had a great phrase that said, you can only frugal so much, right? And so if you think of levers in your life that you can make a difference financially, well, budgeting, yeah, there are levers there, but they're not huge levers to really magnify. Usually it's on the income side. You know, what can you do either now to improve yourself from an income perspective? So I coach clients of, I think of this idea of pre-tirement is, I coach clients on, hey, maybe you're investing, but you're investing in yourself to improve your prospects for income, whether that's in your current role, whether it's in a pivot role. What can you do now to start setting yourself up from an income perspective, either now or in retirement? Do you feel like maybe sometimes those are in conflict, whereas the money and the stress kind of go hand in hand? You know, we talk about the balance of both points, but sometimes I see, like I know in my own job, I could pursue the money but along with that money is going to, I mean, those incremental additional amounts was going to come a significant amount of stress. Like, have you ever thought about From that? a family perspective? Yeah. Like maybe that, maybe that additional responsibility that would come with that additional money means additional time on the weekends or nights right. or, or whatever else. And it's specifically with that person that's thinking about pre-tirement and balance. Well, that's where, you know, I think of life when it comes to money things is a negotiation. There's no free lunch, right? You're going to have to decide and prioritize what's important to you. So when I look at my role, it's like, If you want to accomplish all that, we can lay out plans to start working towards that. But you're going to have to decide whether you want that journey or not. Yeah. Right? And and that's just life. There's choices. But there are more creative things. Because most of us, when we're thinking about that, it's, oh, I need to put in more hours. You know, we think in very limited ways. And the key is, how do you get creative how other things that you could do? Whether it's your spouse doing things on the side, whether it's side hustle things, or whether it's... Here's a good example. I have a client who was a CEO and just retired. We have been working for five years for her to foster relationships so she could have board work when she was retired. So now she's retiring this year, and now she's already set up to be able to do board work, being on boards of corporations and consulting that gives her a lot more time freedom. That doesn't happen overnight, so it could be... Not working more hours today. It could be setting yourself up so you can have some things that give you time freedom later on. Because she didn't have any of those relationships three, four years ago to even get opportunities. Yeah, that's so interesting. It actually reminds me of something that Brad says. And I'd like to kind of get your thoughts on this, Brad. And, And it's kind of what I was alluding to. Is there a way that you can, what is it? What do you always say? Is there a way that you can carve out the aspects of your job that you enjoy? Right. It's kind of what we affectionately call as like FU money here in the, in the FI community. It's a little, little crass, but finding the items in your job that truly light you up. Nobody wants to pass TPS reports or write emails or attend meetings, but there might be those aspects of your job that you just truly love. Are there ways that boomers can have those conversations? So clearly they add value to their jobs. And if they're just retiring the company loses that, right? They lose institutional knowledge. They lose decades of work and value. How can they have that conversation with their VP or boss or whomever it may be to stay on in some capacity with where they really enjoy it? And that, that's a great point because a lot of us, boomers especially, they just sort of end up in a career because they're so good at it, but it has all this other stuff. Luckily, most companies are much more open to those discussions than they've ever been before. And it is. It's like, how can I, well, a good example is how could I work from home more? Where you start there is, and every company culture is different, but obviously it's all about relationships, right? Is I'm a big believer in, you know, Seth Godin linchpin. If you're indispensable, you have a lot more control in the marketplace. So if you're working in a corporation, the first thing is, how are you perceived in that corporation, right? What is your reputation within the corporation? Because you're basically a little small business. The stronger your relationships with your peers and your superiors, and the better your reputation from a work standpoint, the more negotiation you have. They're like, hey, yeah, we love John, and we would never want to lose him. So like my wife says, she knows when I have an idea because I plant seeds. (laughs) 
And then I water them. I wanted a dog, and I wanted a very specific type of dog, so I had, like, pictures of puppies of those dogs all over the house, you know. It didn't really matter what the dog looked like. And you just up. water, talk about it. And I think you do that the same way in a corporation, right, is you don't go into the bosses and say, I need to work from home four days a right. week. Or I quit. Right. Yeah. No, you, you, hey, is it okay if I do this on next, you know, you start with, like, Friday afternoon, I have to do this. I'll work remotely. And then you get them comfortable with the fact that, hey, this is working, and you slowly water it and you dial it up. Hopefully, hopefully with them seeing that you're more productive or you're not missing a beat. I think you have to nurture these things. But what ends up happening is most of us don't think about this stuff until there's some pressure point where we're upset and we want to deal with it now. Right. The key is if, and that's the intentionality is, you get if you have some forethought, you can work your way so you don't get into that situation where it has to be this demand because you've had enough. So, Roger, I'm curious. You obviously are serving a different community than ours, right? It's people who have been living under a certain construct of traditional retirement for years, and there are always those existential worries: Am I going to have enough money? Right? What's the number I need? What's going to happen to healthcare? How do I bridge the gap before Medicare comes in? What do you tell somebody who's approaching you five years before retirement? How do they get ready financially? And I guess, again, it's, it's mentally, right? It's always mentally. But I guess really with a focus on the financial side. This segment just got a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think this is a big failing of traditional retirement advice is because it's so focused on the number, right? The, what's my number? I, you know, that construct I think is really dangerous for a lot of people because demographically baby boomers are going to live longer in retirement than anybody in history. They're going to be more active than anybody in history. They're going to spend more money than anybody in history. So the math just doesn't work. That's why we have a retirement crisis. And the need, especially when you're leaving work, which emotionally puts you in a really vulnerable place, right? Because now my pension or my 401k, that's all I got. And then I just gave up my ability to earn income. That's vulnerable. What ends up happening is when you're vulnerable, you want more certainty. You want to be on stable ground, right? Because that's just a human nature. And there is no stable ground because whether it's the markets, inflation, your family dynamics, your health, all of that is fundamentally unknowable. And that's really scary. And what ends up happening, in my opinion, is that people will grasp for, I call them duct tape solutions, an annuity or something that they're sold that talks to that fear. Reverse mortgage, right? (laughs) Whatever takes the pain away, right? Because they just want the pain away. I think it's much healthier is to really accept that you can't figure it out. It's always going to be uncertain. And if you and we can accept that intellectually, but if you accept that at a deeper level, then the issue becomes not figuring it out. But how do I create a framework so I can iterate very quickly and have lots of little conversations to identify risks and opportunities so I can take little actions? Because where you get power from, because if you look far out and you're 60 years old, it's scary because you don't, you know, all the things you just talked about. But what empowers people is what can I do in the next three months or six months to iterate, to take a baby step? And all ways of life, as soon as you have some concrete little actions and a framework, you gain confidence. Yeah, that's wonderful. Not to really put you on the spot, but give me a couple examples of like somebody comes to you. What are those little steps they could take in the next year? Like, is it have that conversation with the spouse? I really genuinely don't know. I mean, this is so far outside of my area of knowledge. What does that look like for somebody who's 60, who's thinking about retiring in the next couple of years? So the, I'm a big process guy. I always We all think in tactics, and I think process leads to strategy, leads to tactics. I have the same conversations with everybody, and I have checklists for each one. And I'm like a wind-up dial, which allows me to be creative with them. So the conversations are around what is it we want visually long-term, and it doesn't have to be clear and focused, but then where do we want to be a year or two years from now? And then it's cash flow. Where are the risks and opportunities And what's one thing we can do in the next three to six months to take a baby step there? That could be investing in yourself. It could be hustling more. It could be taking certification. It could be lots of different things. I am in love with the net worth statement because it encapsulates all of your financial decisions. It's your dashboard. Okay, if I have this cash flow and I have free cash flow, which is savings, how do I best allocate that to work to where I say I want to go to? 
And there's only five things you can do with money. You can give it away. You can spend it. You can pay down debt. You can save it or you can invest it. And then there's a hierarchy of how you should address those. And so, you know, I have worksheets on all those little hierarchies. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love that. Are, are those worksheets available to listeners of your podcast on the website? Is that something? Yeah, and they're all download? encapsulated in the book. Good Wonderful. segue. <laughs> nice. Just kidding. Uh, they're all encapsulated in the book where the book just talks about how you should rethink retirement and then what conversations you should be having. And there's worksheets attached to all of it. And I know the book is Rock Retirement. It can be found anywhere books are sold. We'll have a link to it in the show notes for today's episode. But I think even more than that, our audience is going to get absolute benefit from those worksheets. But I have a feeling they're going to want to know more about this tailored approach that you're talking about. And they're going to want to connect with you. So like, what is the best way for someone to connect well, with you? The two best ways is the Retirement Answer Man show. Even if you're young, here's the thing about if you're young, younger, meaning not baby You're going to get old. <laughs> uh, well, you're going to get old. But also, I wish I had thought in these terms younger when I was younger, because then you have so much more time to iterate and create a life you don't actually want to retire from. So the Retirement Answer Man sh- podcast, obviously, and then the YouTube channel, the same name, is where I just have a blast talking Maybe about this Maybe we could do something together on that YouTube channel. Yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> hey, Roger, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was awesome. Thanks, guys. All right, guys. Well, unfortunately, that's going to bring this episode to a close. I have a couple announcements to make. Camp Fi South is going to be the last Camp Fi of 2018. There are still some tickets available. And Stephen reached out to us. He is giving a discount to Chooseify listeners. It is $75 coupon. So this is a very valuable coupon. If you go to Chooseify.com slash Camp Fi, the links for all of the camps are, are right there on the sidebar, depending on whether or not you're looking at it on mobile or your desktop. But if you click on Camp Fi South and you register for that ticket, make sure you put in the promo code Chooseify to get $75 off. Now that camp takes place September 7th through September 10th. That is in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's a short drive from the airport. And I checked with them in terms of major cities. Those of you in, I believe, like Dallas, Texas, Austin, Texas, it is, I believe, around a four-hour drive. So it's also drivable from those major cities. And it's got an awesome speaker lineup. For those of you that have listened to this show, uh, Cody Berman, so second generation Phi, if you want to inspire your teenage or young adult, Fly to Phi, awesome, awesome presentation planned, as well as the military guide. Now, Doug Norman is someone that is long overdue to come on this show. We've been in talks with him, and it's going to be happening either at the end of this year or beginning of next year. But he is like the resource if you're in the military, interested in personal finance and financial independence. Absolutely incredible speaker, and he is going to be there. Ready Investor One, Paul Thompson, is a real estate investor with a podcast. It is focusing on building this designer lifestyle. Whitney Hansen and Diversify, so Doc G from Diversify. That is an incredible speaker lineup, and if you decide to go, make sure you use the promo code CHOOSEFI on that event page to get $75 off the cost of your ticket. And I just want to express a huge... Thank you to Stephen, both for extending this promo to our community, but also for taking this to all the different cities that he has taken it to. This truly is something that he is doing for the FI community to give people a chance to get out of their day-to-day grind and spend a couple of days with some like-minded individuals. I think it's going to be an incredible value add for you. Now, as you know, we like to finish every episode by doing a drawing for a copy of a book that we have found useful. And there's three books that we offer. The first book is J.L. Collins' book, The Simple Path to Wealth. The second book is Dominic Cortuccio's book, Design Your Future. And the third book is Vincent Puglisi's book, Freelance to Freedom. If you want to enter the drawing, all you need to do is just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes, follow the instructions there and leave us a short written review, and then send us an email to feedback at chooseify.com, letting us know that you left a review and what screen name you left it under. And then every week on the Friday Roundup, we announce the winners. Brad, how many winners do we have today? All right, Jonathan, we have two winners today. And the first winner is Sheena. And Sheena said, the best five podcasts. I normally use a different podcasting app, but downloaded iTunes after binge listening to these podcasts just to make sure these guys got the rating they deserve. Brad and Jonathan are super engaging and relatable hosts with insightful questions and comments, both when interviewing a guest and during the Friday Roundup. Even when the subject matter doesn't relate to me personally, there are useful little nuggets of information that I can't pass up. Keep up the good work. You guys are killing it. All right. And Jonathan, the second winner is Blair. And Blair says, wealth, health, knowledge, and power. I've listened to all the major financial and investing podcasts in the past year. And this one is by far my favorite. I've been consuming every episode since the first one, like a fat kid tearing through a box of assorted candies. 
Each one has some bit of unique and helpful information. Some episodes feel like they were re- recorded just for me, and there are other ones that I think will have nothing for me, yet I'm able to glean some bit of useful knowledge off of. Whether you are new and curious about financial matters or are a veteran of the fire scene, every episode by these guys is worth the listen. Take what they say and apply it to your life. The worst that will happen is that you'll be a little smarter, wealthier, and happier. If you dive in head first, you'll be much smarter, healthier, and happier. Thank you so much for those reviews. Truly the lifeblood of the show. And we appreciate you joining us twice a week as we continue on this journey. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.